you could find something that suited your uh, diet and your temperament and your mood. Uh, would you allow me to sing you a song? Is that possible? It's a bit unusual. It's unscripted. It's not on the program. <laughs> this song is uh, uh, it's a favorite of mine. It's called Going Back. I think I'm going back to the things I learned so well in my youth. I think I'm returning to those days when I was young enough to know the truth. Now there are no games to only pass the time. No more electric trains, no more trees to climb. But thinking young and growing older is no sin. And I can play the game of life to win. I can recall the time when I wasn't afraid to reach out to a friend. And now I think I've got a lot more than a skipping rope to land. Now there's more to do than watch my sailboat glide. And every day can be my magic carpet ride. And I can play hide and seek with my fears and live my days instead of counting my years. Let everyone debate the true reality. I'd rather see the world the way it used to be. A little bit of freedom's all we lack. But catch me if you can, I'm going back. Thank you. I'm just preparing the way. Just, uh, just. <laughs> so welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, this is the second session. Yes, we're talking about um, why things are not ideal, uh, not really the way we want to see them. And I've given it the title, What Gives Rise to Conflict? So through this understanding, again, it's not simply approaching... Um, you know, issues or things which are calling out for peacemaking or resolving conflict. There are ways to do that. There are university courses you can take, you know, to understand uh, conflict resolution. And there are many people more versed in this and more able to do that than, than myself, certainly. And even then, somewhere, that's not our purpose here, is to look a bit deeper. So I'm going into some of these religious traditions as well to see, you know, is there something really valuable, um, as it says in that song, to kind of find and bring back, you know, into the present day uh, that we could use. So reality is tragically very different from uh, the ideal which we were painting earlier. We have a world of conflict. It's being brought to our attention increasingly, um, you know, day by day. Um, we acknowledge or need to acknowledge that we have two purposes in life. These are not contradictory purposes by any means, but there are two purposes that should work together well. Uh, one is the purpose for our own lives and our own well-being. The other is the purpose of our lives in relation to others, and this is Father Moon speaking in the 1970s, to our family, our nation, or the whole world. 
there must be balance. If too much stress is placed on individualism, then collective virtues are lost, love of nation, brotherhood of the people, family integrity, relationships between parents and children, and finally, even the value of individuals themselves. These things get, get lost when that balance isn't right. So this is relating to the topic we had earlier, which was living for others or living for the sake of others. That's very related to this pair system and its healthy development that we talked about. Uh, and I exist in a relationship with the whole, um, my whole community, world, environment, everything. I exist to benefit the whole, actually, and that's a higher purpose in life. So if I'm latching onto that, I'm very much in tune with the kind of principles of the creator in that way. So if an individual lives, and just pictured any individual, it could be me, uh, living within the kind of totality of the whole, we're not independent, we're interdependent creatures, as we said. So if I live for the whole, um, then actually, naturally, the whole comes to support me. It supports the individual. So this way of life, even though there is a feeling that you're maybe going to lose something, actually you won't. That's a, that's a smokescreen or a paradox. You, you won't lose. The, rather, if you're giving to the whole, the whole will support you. Cause of conflicts comes when this is not working well. If, as an individual, I'm basically self-centered and I have less regard for a higher purpose in life as a result of that, the main purpose is me, then uh, I'm starting to think that others exist for my benefit or should exist for my benefit. That diminishes or even ignores the value of the whole. So rather than that uh, individual comfortably within the whole, giving and being supported by the whole, it's like this, it's expecting the whole to support me in a very unbalanced way. Uh, and that's quite simplistically put, but does it ring true to you, this kind of uh, circumstance? Yeah. So there have been ideologies which have justified conflicts, and we've been through a kind of experimentation of that so with 70 years of communism in the last century, and the kind of uh, effects of that are still carrying on. Um, so this is Father Moon talking in the 1970s about this. He said, according to the logic of communism, there will be constant struggles as long as there are classes of people. But in our ideology, and it encourages those struggles actually, thinking it's uh, for a good purpose, but in our ideology, which is what you're hearing today, right, in unificationism, there are no class differences, but only family relationships. Here there is no discrimination. There are no people above or below, but only the relationships between parents and children providing order in the family. So we may think sometimes, you know, parents, children is like this kind of order. And it might even be used by a Marxist writer to say there's oppression, the family is a means of oppression of people. No, it's not like that. There's an order, and to have order is actually right and proper and of benefit to everybody. So that is what we see in the family, but actually each is living for the other in that circumstance. He goes on to say, according to communist ideology, uh, mine is mine, and yours is mine. It's a summary. On our part, we must think mine is yours, and yours is the nations, and the nations is the world's, and the world's is God's, and God's is mine. The spirit of unification must be greater than the power of communism in practice, in hope, and in ideals. Both start off as having kind of ideals or goals in that way. But uh, this, as you see, creates a much more harmonious, cyclical, uh, self-supportive system, right? Which uh, uh, makes a lot of logic uh, internally. The reality of human nature is uh, like this. Uh, we have a selfish nature that's very well developed. 
in many pl many places. You know, uh, some they have much less than others, but still, you know, human what we sometimes call human nature. You heard that expression, where people say, "Oh, this person acted in such a greedy way or a, a violent way." It's just human nature. We are saying no. That's not human nature. That's an aberration. That's something gone wrong, actually. But in this circumstance, we do have in, inherited, anyway, a selfish or self-centered nature. Uh, but every person has an original nature, which is relatively undeveloped. But nevertheless, you know, you could identify that with the conscience or something in each person which you can speak to, even in the most wayward person, a person who's quite uh, difficult to deal with, they'll have something in them which can, it's the remnants of the conscience, right? They may not want to listen to it, but you can find a way to touch them. Really, that needs to be developed. So there's a, a problem here within the individual, or you could say within the mind of the individual, right? I know I characterize it as a relationship between mind and body, and that's how often it works out. We can perceive it that way. But in the end, it's a problem in the mind. You know, there's a self-centered mind, and there's a mind that wants to do good for others. But which has the upper hand, right? That's the question. And this is another point which is well supported by the religious texts of the world's religions. So I've got some different quotations here for you. The conflicted self, here in Sikhism, in the Adi Granth Sahib, it says, whoever proclaims himself good, no, goodness approaches him not. It's always like a, a little bit of kind of poetic language, isn't it, in the English? But I'm sure you catch the meaning of that. As, as soon as you start saying, well, I'm good, why isn't everybody else like me? This is probably an indication that you're not, actually. Right? It's, so it's a very risky thing, uh, and that's, a, that's a, a kind of thing you can trip up over in the religious life. People become confident, they think they're better than they are, actually. Um, Hinduism, you have this uh, expression, the mind is twofold, the pure and also the impure. So there are two minds, in a sense. Or the Native American tradition, I love these, it's from the Mohawk tradition. Every person has both a bad heart and a good heart. <laughs> and Christianity, you have writings of Saint Paul, he said, I do not do, he's talking about himself, right? I do not do the good that I want. But the evil I do not want is what I do. This whole chapter is him agonizing over a kind of inner struggle. We don't quite know what it is. Um, but obviously he wasn't satisfied. He wanted to love people in an unconditional way maybe, but he found actually something pulling against that, some self-centered concerns or concerns for his safety or this kind of thing. I think you know such a, a holy person was not a bad person in any way, but it's often the, the road of the, um, the person who's really pursuing a devout life, right, of prayer, of meditation, as, a, as a, maybe as a monk or nun or something like that, and um, whatever tradition, they will be, you know, as they become purer in their mind and heart, then they discover more inside themselves that needs to change, right? It's like yeah, you didn't notice that, but now it's coming out, right? this kind of idea. So I looked around for the person who looked most conflicted, and I came across this chap. Right? <laughs> Conflict in the mind, right? So simply put, we have some selfish thoughts, words, and actions. They often come immediately to us, and it's the body dominating. It's those concerns that are attached to the body, pulling us in an evil way, whether it's desires for money or comforts or uh, sex or food or these kind of things, uh, uh, leading us that way. But every person, as we said, had a good, has a good heart, right? Uh, as well as a bad heart or a, some original mind. And that is pulling the person towards on, or through more unselfish thoughts to the side of goodness and, you know, actions and... Uh, um, efforts being led, really, by the original mind. So our situation, what we can call the human condition, and again, it's quite universally recognized in 
religion in particular, is there's a battle in the mind of each person. That battle in the individual, that's what's manifest, that, that is what manifests in struggles or conflicts in the family, and then it emerges in the society, and then in the world. So really we have to trace everything back to the situation of the individual. Now, I, I know full well, if you're dealing with a <clears throat> conflict situation between nations, you can't get everybody to go back, you know, in their own minds to a much better state. But why we're teaching this is because largely UPF is an educational organization, and we're promoting a lot of things, including like character education, which deals with this. We have a large project underway in Nigeria. We've done things within the movement in... Um, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in Russia and in China and places, wherever we are free to do that. We have a program uh, running in, even in Palestine, actually, in school. So, you know, there is uh, educational work, but also, you know, understanding this is important for peacemakers to understand the problems that come from uh, individuals and the way the mind works or doesn't work well. Uh, Religions have stories, and even you could say cultures have stories, because it goes beyond uh, religion. Um, origins about where conflict comes from, and there are certain clues in these stories. Uh, like all myths, they often contain something of profound truth or eternal truth in them, and intuition or insights about the human condition. Uh, many are... Uh, metaphorical, but surprisingly universal. And uh, if you analyze these stories about origin of evil or origin of conflict, uh, they often relate to the misuse of love, especially sexual immorality, which is an interesting point because it's, mm. it's quite universal. Here are some of them, this is why I'm saying this, from the Uttaranga Sutra, which is a Jain uh, text. It says, it is better to die than to indulge in partaking of forbidden lustful pleasure. That's quite strong, isn't it? Right? It's better to die. Right? Uh, you have in Buddhism, in the Dharmapada, uh, Dharmapada, the man who goes to the wife of another, you can guess with what intent, right? Digs up the very roots of life. It's very profoundly disturbing and upsetting you know, to all concerned, everybody affected by that uh, uh, unfaithful action. Uh, here in the Holy Quran, do not come near adultery, for it is shameful. It's a shameful deed and evil, opening the road to other evils, a kind of gateway evil in that respect. Here you have in Judaism, in the Talmud, which is the commentary to the Torah, written by various rabbis over the years, uh, it's talking about the Garden of Eden story, which you might or might not be uh, familiar with, but it's an explanation of how evil came into the world. What was the wicked serpent contemplating at that time? He thought, I shall go and kill Adam, the first man, and wed his wife, and I shall be king over the whole world. Somebody seeking to dominate others or come out on the top of the pile, as it were, through through this kind of domination, through uh, sexual immorality, misusing that for that purpose. And here in Hinduism, it gets even more, oh, I feel always, I have to say to the ladies, this is not me speaking this, I'm just quoting this. <laughs> Formerly, all creatures were virtuous, and by themselves they obtained divinity. Then women who had been virtuous became wicked witches, and Brahma filled them with wanton desires, which they in turn inspired in men. He created anger, and henceforth all creatures were born in the power of desire and anger. Wow, interesting, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Do you want more? I've got a couple more. And uh, this is from Sikhism. Sexual desire is the window. Pain and pleasure are the gatekeepers. Virtue and sin are the gates. Hmm. Or uh, St. Paul again in 1 Corinthians, a flee from sexual immorality. He who sins sexually sins against his own body. Of course, it does damage to others, but 
you're also damaging your own temple, your own self, your own holiness or your own image of God is suffering because of that. And uh, so think about it. Think of the consequences, not only to others, but also even to yourself. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? How universal this is. <clears throat> so Father Moon delved very deeply into starting really with the Genesis story. That was his entry point. Um, but uh, through his spiritual experiences and his questioning and his encounters uh, in spirit, then he really uh, discerned some very important things which happened to be supported by this story. So it's not like we have to believe in this story or it's fine from my point of view if we just treat it as myth or something which is there in our culture. But nevertheless, in as much as it gets down to the root of a problem, it's very interesting to l drill down and look at that. So that's what I'm going to do now, if you don't mind. Um, the basis of the story is that our first ancestors, they're named Adam and Eve, were in a garden, an idyllic garden, and they were uh, free to eat of any of the fruit of the trees that were there. So it's a kind of, you know, no, no restriction, except there was a, a commandment saying, voice of God to them, saying, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for if you, in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. The prohibition is death, meaning, probably more logically, a spiritual death, a kind of cutting off from our source and that uh, original purpose in God. Um, but there's a clear prohibition given, don't eat of the fruit of that tree, and of course it's a tree with an unusual name, isn't it, right? It's not a regular tree. So even though there are various, you know, people like to interpret this as literally, you know, a fruit of a tree, um, Father Moon's understanding is not like that. In fact, I'll give you the conclusion first, right? Because this is not such a theological exposition. So his conclusion, and it didn't, wasn't come too lightly, is that this fruit, which is prohibited, uh, from being eaten is actually love itself. It's representing love itself, especially the holy husband-wife relationship. That means our first ancestors should grow, like according to that first blessing or first uh, foundation of peace, to their own individual spiritual maturity first, to learn how to love, because love is a very powerful force, mm -hmm. right? And then, on the basis of their own kind of uh, maturing to such a point that they can, under God's blessing, enter a marriage relationship, that will be fruitful as well. And that's where the fruit comes, right? So um, it's not a bad metaphor, I would say, right? <laughs> because uh, to know, tree of knowledge of good and evil, to know in biblical language is to have sexual relations, right? There's a little Christmas story there which says something like... Uh, um, Joseph was betrothed to Mary, the mother of Jesus, but he did not know her. Well, of course he knew her, right? They were close families, but uh, it meant he didn't have any sexual relationship with her. So, of course, when a baby comes along, what's he going to think, right? Um, so, you know, this is how the word was used. It makes me think that probably when this story was first shared, which is maybe three and a half thousand years ago. It's a long time ago. It's been with us. Uh, but probably it was very well understood for what it means uh, uh, in it, it, for its audience of the day, right? But we've put layer and layer and layer on this, right? So even major churches as, uh, will say when asked, you know, uh, was this referring to a sexual sin? They'll say, no, it wasn't. It was just a disobedience or uh, turning away from God or something, which is all true. It was those things, but this is going deeper. Do you follow me? Yeah. It's actually exposing this. It's an uncomfortable thing to expose, right? Because it means something about uh, love has become corrupted. Uh, also, it's a good metaphor because to bear fruit is to produce a good result, isn't it? That's a kind of meaning. And, uh, you know, the, the fruit of this relationship, of course, is children. It's building a lineage. So a lineage comes out of this, and we want to, to be a good lineage, passing on a good tradition. And that's where the next generation is going to learn from and inherit from. And 
these concepts we've covered already in our first lecture, right? So, yes, we can say, well, or rather we might uh, you know, consider, is it a test of obedience solely that? Not really, because who, who or which loving parent would test their children in such a way with something that would cause their death, you know, something tempting? No, you don't tempt your children and then punish them because they give in. You know, that's not a, a parental love, actually. Uh, also, this fruit, whatever it is, is more desirable than life itself. So uh, the prohibition was, or in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. So what can move people more than that kind of concern? It must be nothing other than love itself. People will die for love. In a good way, you know, love of country because of necessity or to defend their family. But also if love is, you know, uh, they're totally besotted in love and it's unrequited, they might consider taking their life or ending their life because uh, there's no love in their life or they've been hurt in this area. So love is a very powerful force in, in the universe. You know, we shouldn't just think it's a simple a construct of the mind. So it's portrayed, whatever this is, as being essential to fulfilling life's goals. So that's why his conclusion was this is to do with love itself. So if you then kind of look at it, the story this way, the green sections are like natural growth that uh, you know, a human being should go through. So Adam and Eve were, or our first ancestors were growing, uh, but only reached a certain point of their development, especially spiritual development. Uh, during that growth time, they were given a prohibition not to eat you know, during that time of growth while they're immature. That makes sense, doesn't it? It's largely what we've inherited and what every parent will do. They will say to their teenage daughter, you know, they'll be concerned, what time are you coming home? Who are you with? What are, the, what, what are you going to do? You know, this kind of thing. Uh, it's understandable because we want to protect this uh, special uh, aspect of love, especially in a young, growing person. Uh, but it's where we're most vulnerable, you know. That's where people get most attacked. Um, so... Uh, through um, not obeying that commandment, not listening to it, rather than you know, obeying and being free to eat and enjoying the kind of fruits of that spiritual maturity and marriage blessing, they fell to a, a kind of area where love is not working properly. It's outside the realm of God's creation. Um, here's Father Moon explaining that. Back in 1995, he said, what is the reality of our world today? Disorder and sickness of every kind, including war, violence, and drug abuse, have infected humankind. More important, the rapid collapse of sexual morality among the young and increasing divorce rate and breakdown of the family are all destroying the foundation of human society. All these things originate from the fall, from this original time. So that's a kind of conclusion and that's also why I added that little caveat in the beginning. You know, not everybody's life works out as they want. You know, some people are uh, single mothers through no fault of their own, or they have children who get in with the wrong crowd through no fault of their own, really. You know? uh, so I'm not making any judgment on the situation. But also, if we don't wake up and realize this, we are missing something so essential, actually, we need to talk about this. We need to have a conversation about this as a society. Do you remember the definition of true, genuine love? I'm not, I'm not going to test you, but just think, you know, what was it? Unconditionally caring about the happiness of another person. This is just, I said, just one that I've settled on as one I like at the moment, right? Uh, I think it works. So, um, what is conditional false or imitation love, because there is love and there is love, right, in the world. There are, you know, love can masquerade as the true thing when it actually it's not. Uh, it's a very self-centered love. Well, false love is defined, I think, helpfully this way. I care how you make me feel. Right? It's all about that. It's all about my feelings. That's the inherent self-centered nature of it. I care how you make me feel. 
So this is why some people, um, you know, they are always looking for this falling in love aspect. Okay? And even in terms of serial relationships, they may have quite a serious relationship with somebody, but it collapses and then they're out looking for somebody else. Because they love that feeling of falling in love. But that's not all that love's about, right? That's a little mechanism to help you know, bring the right people together. Uh, and then you, know, you shouldn't worry about that, right? So this becomes the important thing for people because I care how you make me feel. That means if you, if I perceive that you don't love me, I don't love you anymore, right? Or if you are particularly angry towards me, then I don't love you. So one day I can love you and the next day I don't love you, right? It's a very fickle love, isn't it? So um, I care how you make me feel. And I'm not only talking about romantic love, because love should be for all relationships that we're in, every relationship. So even parent to child, sometimes a parent, you know, they're well-meaning, but they might only express love when their child comes home with good grades or good marks from school, right? And the child will be aware of this. That's why, oh, you're such a good little boy, a little girl. Thank you, you're wonderful. Let's call, call up granny and tell her, you know. Uh, they only get praise when they're doing well, but when they're not doing well, they get a kind of cold treatment. That means the parent is thinking, I care how you make me feel. It's more about, you know, that, that feeling. Do you follow me? Yeah. So even in that relationship, you can have, make this kind of mistake. Of course, parents have to, you know, Discipline, guide, correct children. That's part of their job. But you have to do it without any self-centered feeling. It's not because you make me angry. That's not the, that's not the reason. Because I want you to be better. I want you to avoid you know, difficulties in your own life. So this is why I'm saying it to you. So you have to say it with love, actually. Even be quite strict with love. But uh, it's necessary, isn't it? So... Uh, this is, I think, helpful distinction between these two kind of qualities of love. A lot of people only grow up knowing this kind of love. They do not experience, it's a tragedy that that's the case, they don't experience true unconditional love or parental love. So that's what they're learning. That's what their experience is. That's what they're going to replicate in life. That's what they think it's all about. So it's very tragic. And that's why sometimes it's interesting to see the process of where people have a profound religious experience. It, because they feel for the first time there's a source there, which I wasn't aware of, of unconditional love that loves even a person like me, who's a bit of a wretch, you know. And that is life-changing for people. They don't want to do what they were doing before. They want to be different, you know. So it's an interesting process, very real process for people. Change or, in religious terms, we often call it rebirth or experience. Um, here's a quotation from, a, I'm throwing in a few other, other teachers or sages, right? As you notice. This is from a, a writer called Eckhart Tolle. Anybody come across him? Yeah, I admire his work very much. Wonderful speaker. Uh, I went to hear him talk in the Methodist Hall here in London. Um, from one of his books called A New Earth, uh, Create a Better Life, he said, what is commonly called falling in love is in most cases an intensification of self-centered wanting and needing. <laughs> you become addicted to another person or rather to your image of that person. And in the falling in love stage, then the person is putting on their best image, right? They're not really, you know, you're not really seeing the, the true person. It has nothing to do with true love, he uses that expression, which contains no wanting whatsoever, no wanting for yourself. Interesting, isn't it? People are coming to this conclusion through different routes, you know. That's why I'm, I'm very optimistic about, uh, you know, we're in... We're in desperate need of a real spiritual revolution right? along these lines, just as we've had or are having with you know, external scientific, technological side of things, which is wonderful, but we need it now, and it will come, a spiritual revolution, because, uh, and it's going to be different to anything before, because it's not coming from one, 
organization or one group or anything like that. It's almost like a shift in consciousness and a shift in uh, an awakening, almost like a, uh, another stage of evolution for humanity, you could call it. Right? So, do you remember uh, the conclusion of the um, first lecture? That was way, way back in the morning, before lunch, right? Remember that? We had this, three foundations for peace, right? Uh, individual peace, peace in the family, and society as a result, you know, because it's the building block, and universal peace with uh, nature and, and the world around us. So uh, this was our conclusion. But because of this mind-body conflict and the misuse of love, we find that the first one becomes somehow the mind and body are under what we could call evil influence. Um, it's, it's, it's a distorted picture of the original, and it sets them... Um, kind of on, on a more self-centered basis and uh, uh, reason for existence. And that produces a selfish person, right? largely, right? Uh, then if that person uh, who is spiritually immature and they haven't learned how to love in the right way, and then they get married, they bring that person into the marriage, right? And maybe under the first, you know, uh, months or years of marriage, it's very rosy and very beautiful, and they're very much in love with each other. But soon that person's self-centeredness is going to come out, and that's going to cause a problem. You know? And it could be from either partner or from both. You know, it's, it starts to rub against each other. It's like they almost have slightly conflicting purposes. You know? I'm living for myself. Well, I'm living for myself. You know? And then it, it creates disharmony and fighting and arguing, and then you lose, you lose trust and there's no basis for love in a genuine way. So this is you know, what we have inherited, unfortunately. Uh, in some families it works very well, and I'm always amazed how, how in the world there are so many good people who just try to make the best of life, right? And they're doing a great job in difficult circumstances. But as a society or community, we need to revisit and learn these things. So we see, as a result of this conflicts in society and in wars, it comes from that same divided self in the individual. Uh, and this is the important role of UPF, is to connect the family with world peace. You can't talk about world peace without talking about family, and you can't talk about that without talking about the individual, right? So it's making this connection, even though it seems like a lot more work, right? Um, we wish there were a quicker way. No, this is, this is what has to be uh, addressed. And then we see, as a result, there's environmental damage. You know, the way the uh, nature is suffering, it's because of human beings' greed or self-centered, you know, exploitation, because they're not thinking of the future, they're thinking of just about the pound in their pocket. They're just making you know, uh, things good for themselves while they can. So it's, it's going to bring a bad result if you live that way. So this is what we have to sort out as humanity, actually. We have to sort this out. Here's a little section which talks about this, this idea of evil influence, because that's maybe a kind of new territory for some people. but. Um, it's an explanation, a study course on this unification principle. It says there, to state that the world is under evil influences is to suggest there are negative spiritual forces operating in our lives. Such influences can f affect a person only as long as he or she cooperates with them. It's like you're having a kind of mental conversation with them or allowing them to influence you. Sin, which is a very religious word, right, but picked deliberately from, from uh, religious vocabulary, sin may be thought of as an act or thought which violates God's law and which inhibits negatively our own growth to perfection, our own but perfection, this kind of spiritual maturity we were talking about. It's working against that. Sin is thus never simply against God. It's also against our own self in that it violates our own deepest essence. So it's how to get back to the true essence, the true humanity in each person. 
and allow that to blossom and to um, emerge. This is really our, our challenge, right? It's a big challenge. So uh, through his analysis of this story and his spiritual experiences, Father Moon concluded, again, I'm, I'm kind of shortcutting to conclusions, right? So if you have questions, then it requires further kind of uh, study or explanation. But um, he came to a very useful, I find it personally very useful understanding of what is wrong with uh, uh, the current state of human being, right? Uh, we say who has inherited a fallen nature as a result of this loss of position and status. Uh, then he identified it as four kind of aspects. The first is failing to take God's standpoint, particularly in loving other people. You know, we don't put ourselves in that kind of position, like a parental position, and, and love other people accordingly. I, I judge people from my own perspective, which is very damaging. Uh, there's a tendency to leave one's proper position. Each of us has a particular role in a family, in a society, in a, you know, and often people don't want what they're given, they want something else, or something that someone else has got, or they want to take over a certain role or position. And that's a tendency. These are all like tendencies which have come through this original mistake, very deep down in the uh, origins of our history as, as modern human beings. Uh, the third is a tendency to reverse dominion, to upset the kind of order of things. And the fourth is to multiply like a criminal act or some kind of wrongdoing. It, to pass it on, to get others involved in what you're doing. That all sounds very theoretical, doesn't it, right? But I liken it to um, uh, falling downstairs, right? <laughs> Have you ever had that experience where you're just... Maybe in the night you're on the top step and you just trip over a little bit of carpet and before you know it, you could be rolling down two steps and hitting your head on the wall and if you bounce off that, maybe you continue rolling and you, you, you bang your head all the way down until you uh, get to the bottom of the stairs and as you're passing, somebody is carrying a tray of glasses and, uh, or a full tea tray, right, ready to bring up to you and, you know, Everything breaks loose, right? So it's a kind of descent uh, into you know, chaos, really. But somewhere, this nature that we have is a little bit like that. We're always trying to hold it in check. And really, we have to overcome it. It starts how? With a self-centered viewpoint, right? So to put some bones on this, uh, imagine... Uh, there's an office, I'm sure a lot of you have, have worked in an office, and uh, everything's going along happily, but then uh, a, a position opens up, a kind of senior position. Right? Everybody wants it. And uh, let's imagine at least two people want that in the office. They think, you know, definitely I'm the person for this. Right? I'm definitely the best person available. Uh, another person thinks, I'd quite like to have that job as well. I think I could do it quite well, you know. Uh, I'm ready to put my name forward, you know. And they have a more of a kind of humble attitude towards it. They're thinking, well, if, if I, I'll just try and get on and do my work as best I can. And if somebody asks me and they recognize my good work, then maybe I get a promotion and I'd be very grateful, right? Other person is a little more scheming, right? This is where the fallen nature is coming in. So it starts with a self-centered viewpoint, but that's something in the mind. Nobody can, you couldn't tell if I was having a self-centered thought right now, could you? Yeah, you wouldn't know, mine. right? Hmm? Can you can read mine. So I'm, I have to be very careful in front of Margaret, you know, because uh, what I'm thinking, you know, she knows everything. But, uh, uh, you know, it starts there and it's not hurting anybody. I mean, you can say it hurts hurting yourself a little bit. It's at least taking some of your energy away from what you should be doing. So it starts in the mind, and this person might be thinking, well, definitely I'm the best person for that job, right? It's like the person who, in a committee, you have a meeting, and they always have the best ideas, for sure. You know, that's their opinion. Yeah. Always my opinion is best, and they're almost grumpy or angry if 
uh, others in the, in, in the committee follow someone else's idea, right? Sometimes your idea is not the best, right? <laughs> That's why we do things together, right? We, we need that. So um, any, anyway, a person can be very kind of looking at everything from their own eyes in a, in a self-centered way. If you do that, you're starting to neglect your own responsibility because you know, you have a job. This person in the office has a job, and they're probably putting a lot of their thought into how to gain an advantage over the other candidates and how to bring them down eventually. So they're believing themselves to be better than others. This is at the origin of racism, of all kinds of, you know, nasty kind of aspects of human nature, isn't it, right? You kind of think, well, of course I am I'm the best, or of course I am better than others, or superior in some way. Uh, and then this gets turned into action, actually, because you start, maybe that person in the office starts to put down that other person um, in order to win favor for themselves. So they send a little message around the office saying, do you know what that other person, what they said about the boss? Don't tell the boss, will you, right? But they said this. They spread a little rumor, right? And of course, knowing and hoping that that will get passed on, right? And eventually reach the ears of the boss. So people start to do these little machinations, little, little things, which is really uh, getting turned into action now because it starts to cause harm to others. You know, somebody is going to be hurt through this. If you spread a rumor that's not true, somebody is going to be damaged. And that person may then go around others trying to get them on their side. You know, put a good word for me in with the boss, will you? You know, because, you know, remember what I did to you, how, how thoughtful I was, or this kind of thing. You know, all kinds of strategies there, sometimes intimidation, sometimes a little bit of pressure. So all this is going on, and, you know, the world is much more than that, of course. A little simple thing I'm describing here. But the process... Is, can, that's uncovered here is very, very insightful and very helpful. It leaves that person feeling justified with what they're doing. They're getting others to do their dirty work for them. And, you know, they're even rewarding people who help them along the way. So they're kind of uh, taking a, becoming a, like a center of beneficence themselves. You know, it's very, very uh, much abusing power and it's... Uh, you know, uh, disrupting relationships. So this kind of thing happens clearly. Right? And in religion, it tends to be that, uh, we had the word sin before, sins are really often talked about in terms of one word concepts. It could be like lust or greed or anger, unrighteous anger, it might be qualified because some anger's good, right? Um, and then this is, uh, you know, the only way to really pass that on is through stories, largely. That's the proven method, because a dictionary definition is not enough to change a person's behavior, right? Um, but this is kind of showing how these things arrive, arise. How does anger arise? How does jealousy arise? And it gets under the skin of that, which is, I think, why it's very important. Here's Father Moon on unity of mind and body. He said, as long as fallen nature remains with us, history will always be riddled with struggle and turmoil. And this will be the case no matter how much we may sing of our ideals or cry out for peace. This is why we conclude that we will not find the path to peace until we have pulled out this fallen nature by its root. The way to world peace does not lie far off at the ends of the earth. Rather, it will be found only in the place where each of us is able to unite our divided mind and body. That really brings it home, doesn't it, right? <laughs> um, that connection, which might be kind of a new way of thinking to us, but actually, when you look at life in the great religious traditions of the world, it's very much to do with this. It says, um, unlike the kind of materialistic view which says the problem is out there, we have to change society by force, and then we point the guns at the people and have them you know, obey, um, and we, we eliminate dissenters. No, 
it, it, religion has always said you have to start with yourself. You have to start in your own heart and you have to go through that process and become a better person, essentially, right? Uh, so this, is, this was kind of rather beautifully expressed when uh, uh, Mother Moon, uh, Hak Jahan Moon, came, came to uh, Europe, actually, this time without her husband, he passed away, and um, she came to Vienna and spoke there. The title of her speech was, was Peace Starts With Me. Peace Starts With Me. It was a kind of big campaign at a huge, you know, uh, stadium filled with people. Uh, very wonderful and exciting program. But she spoke on this topic and others, and uh, under this title, which sounds kind of catchy, modernish, but no, actually, it's an age old truth which is upheld and practiced by the world's religious traditions. That is, <clears throat> peace starts, first of all, with myself, with sorting out this. Uh, damaging conflict or state of conflict between mind and body in myself. And I have to have them work together, centering on a common purpose, which comes from the creator. You know, everything which is, I'm using a little clicker here, right? Everything which is created by human beings is created first with a purpose in mind, right? Because I want something which can just fit nicely in the hand and which will, you know, move the slides along, either back or forward, right? I want to be able to do that. Uh, so it's all fitting the purpose, and it's coming from an invisible place into a real, substantial place. So everything around us, pretty much everything, is designed, right? With this kind of process behind it, even the building that we're in. So, you know, this is nothing new in that respect, but in terms of overcoming these problems and bringing peace in the world, peace does start with me or the individual. Yeah. And notice that even in religion, we don't say it, it's not you that's the problem, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is tempting to do, isn't it, right? <laughs> Having given you this explanation, you will see, you'll see fallen nature in, a, in everywhere you look, right? Yeah. You'll be, uh, but don't become an expert in finding it in other people become an expert in finding it in yourself if you can, right? And there are big barriers to that. You know, there's a biblical verse uh, which says something like, uh, you know, you will deceive yourselves, which seems like, uh, from the psychological point of view, a bit strange, isn't it? People try to deceive themselves, but they do, right? We do. We try to deceive ourselves. I'm much better than I actually am, or I know what's right, or... You know, you know, it's a kind of self-deception. So we have to question and we have to uh, embark on this kind of journey if we're not already well on that journey. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. That's the end of the second session. Are we going to turn chairs? I don't know. Let's, uh, Robin, what would you like us to do? Take over. Anybody got a burning question or want to? Give yeah. uh, an opinion? Certainly. Okay. One and then here, yes. My question is we have a system of God, by religious society, countries, and so on. How do you please explain the status if they have a flu, been through this system? Mm -hmm. I can say. And my observation is that. I see you have everything in the system. Gone, family, culture, religion, individual, and everyone in the world is not the same. But if a person needs to break the ice from negative atmosphere, yes. how do the person rise up yes. and create a new example? Because not all of us are born in a healthy environment. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Well, this is also one benefit of uh, religion is that it makes almost like um, when it works well. I have to, uh, you know, add that in because it doesn't always work well. But it has the potential to almost like create an alternative society, which can, in which people can take care of each other and be concerned, you know, beyond just their own family for the well-being of. Um, so there's an advantage there. Within this 
uh, work in the broad sense, not UPF in that sense being just one section, but in the broader picture than um, uh, Father and Mother Moon were uh, putting central to their, their particular work in life, something called the marriage blessing. And that is the key that you're looking for, actually, this marriage blessing. Because it's also, it's not just a simple one-time, you know, blessing of marriage. It's actually a, a education for marriage, education in marriage. It's a supportive community of alumni who are um, sharing a same kind of fraternity or sorority of, of uh, blessed families or married families, right? So uh, it has to start, you know, you can't change all the world at once, but this already is bringing people into to a marriage relationship with uh, going over traditional barriers of race, of religion, of culture, and is, is very healing in that respect, and is giving a, a kind of practical format for the practice of true love as we were expressing. So even young people we are encouraging to go, even if they haven't lived a celibate life, to go through a life of purity, preparation, like a certain number of years, three years, and then then really value the, the relationships which they have as something eternal when they're put together with a partner and they find a partner for their eternal relationship. Uh, and, and then kind of feel an identity as a blessed family in which they can raise their children in the same tradition and this understanding. So we have to, in a way, recreate or develop um, uh, a whole tradition, right, to be able to do this. But it's not an exclusive one. It's not like a, a group of which you're either a part or not a part. It's actually um, as, as a wide open community for anybody who supports those ideals, right? Does that help to answer? Um, it has a lot, but I love the way we elaborate this stuff. Okay. I love the way how you get the eyes, because this lecture could go on for hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> because this could go on. <laughs> You're right. And then we have a second question from Costa. Yes, thank you very much. Amazing, as always. Now. I love the explanation about the purse, subject, object. It's like how creation out of how we were created. Anyway, the, the, point, the question I want to ask is, in some um, religions there are some great philosophers with great teachings, and they say, well, they're great teachings, but things missing because that person he was not in a relationship uh, to experience the complete love. That's the one. So what's your thoughts on that? Well. Uh, that's the one thing. So if someone has an experience uh, and the other half uh, to be subject and, and uh, object, uh, then will you consider that as um, a half truth, not the full truth? And the other one is, can uh, now in a modern day, you know what's happened, bombarded from everywhere. I'm not judging, but I'm just saying, same sex couples, etc. So can there be a couple on the same sex and then at the same time being a subject and object? Or then we start running into a problematic situation, subject, subject, confused kids. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Or object, object. Sorry, I, this is very, it, it's not to take a position, it's just uh, your no, understanding. These are understandable things to, 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 to think about. Yes, I mean, um, I, I always think that. Uh, um, spiritual development for humanity is a bit like having um, a blanket on the floor, right? And uh, you reach down into the center of the blanket and pull it up by degrees. Right? So any, anything which is helping people to make this upward progress is good. So there are some traditions, like you say, which have little imitations, maybe even from the founder. Um, and Okay, but it'll still be able to make some progress. Uh, and at some point, it might reach a, a little bit of a ceiling. And there's a kind of development in religions which move them from like servant-type religions, which is not a, I don't say that like looking down on it, because to be a servant of a king is a very noble mm. tradition, right? If you can fulfill that well, you're doing well. Right? 
uh, and there are some which are like uh, adopted son and daughter traditions. Uh, we have to move into not only true son and daughter tradition, but parental tradition. Yes, so it's a kind of progress, historical progress, you know, and this will become more apparent as time goes on, I think, so that always there's, there's we can get back to that original, original point. But as I'll mention in the next and the final session from me, you know, uh, there's a restorative role here, which is uh, uh, worth looking at and we'll, we'll talk about. Um, for uh, other, other kind of combinations or uh, uh, aspects of sexuality and things, um, I think already it's, it's quite a, a challenge in what we're saying here that even a heterosexual uh, husband and wife you know, has to have the question, is our love for each other pure or not? Is it self-centered or not? Right? Mm -hmm. um, if the other kind of variations that you describe, like you know, same-sex marriage, if they're living in a totally unselfish, with a totally unselfish love, I don't know, uh, then, you know, that's a question. My concern, and it's often overlooked in this whole debate, is that realm of uh, self -sex, same sex relationships is very promiscuous. Mm, yes. right. Almost by its nature. Mm. I mean, if you say you're bisexual, this is already promiscuous, isn't it? By definition, by my understanding. So as, as we add the letters to this kind of LGBTQ+, plus, etc., you know, uh, what is the quality of love that is there? That's, mm. that's a question. And I feel it's more, rather than, you know, picking a fight with <laughs> that area, I think let's, let's go and look. So in a way, it's like looking at our own house. You know, what is the quality of my own love? And what's, uh, the, uh, is it, how, how does it rate on this scale? How of, deep is your love? Is it how deep is your love? Yes. <laughs> what a better, no better way to end then. Uh, yeah. One, one yes. little question. Yes. Thank you, anyway, for your questions. It's Both. a wonderful uh, yeah. lecture, or whatever you call it. Honestly, <clears throat> you can go again, more and more dwelling. But, but to reach to inner peace, OK, what's the impact of injustice for a person yeah. you know, on this inner peace? Do you think it is achievable, even with the continuation of the injustices? And don't you think that this injustice will kind of govern his behavior and bitterness and bring the worst yeah. of him as a human being? I'm yeah. not justifying anything or <laughs> anything, but in a conflict in particular, mm -hmm. you know. And you, you, you said, you mentioned the magic word for the future, a, a spiritual uh, revolution. Yeah. But could that spiritual in, uh, revolution be based again on faith or on humanity? I see. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just like those questions to kind of resonate a little bit because they're very, very profound. And uh, it is something I'm uh, thinking in context of these lectures about uh, injustice, like you say, because, you know. Um, we can talk about people having resentment, but sometimes you know there's quite justifiable, justifiable resentment towards uh, others. Is there a way to overcome that in the spiritual path? Um, you know, we're always in relationship with other people. So if you see some change or hear some apology or you see something changing, then maybe also y your heart can can get over those kind of things. That's, sorry to interrupt, mm. but that's why I mentioned the, mm. the continuous injustice. Yeah, I understand. That, 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 you know, that affects the heart, the mind, the yes. spiritual, the spirit, yes. everything. Yes. You throw it all through the window. That's right, <laughs> yes, so yes, I'm yes. Perfect, uh, yeah. I no. what you're saying anyway. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, I think uh, we have sorry. a little... Ah. One more. Sorry, just a second, because...
Yeah. yeah. So we take one more. Do you need a little break as well? I don't know what you're planning, Robin. Where's Robin? Uh, uh, we would normally. Oh no. Go straight on. Yes. Two forty. Oh, that's fine. Two minutes. Yeah. Uh, I just want to continue with her question. So she asked, right, if you have, uh, let me know if I'm correct or not. You mean that if you have, in, you have ever faced any injustice or trauma in your life, still can you be a good person, you know, bitterness, like, you know, that's what you mean, right? No, no, no. You know, it's like, yeah. it's not a question of being good or bad. Yeah. It's a question peace. of Peace, yeah, yeah, peace. Which mm -hmm. yeah. affects the whole community which affects your life, and then it touches the world. Yeah. You know, mother, mm. Especially sure. now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is where I, I want a will, a political, mm. it's not just spiritual, a political will mm. to acknowledge this. As, as I mean, the lady here, the doctor, uh, she is an expert in mental health. She is a doctor in that. And no matter what, it affects Unless, unless you are living, I mean, I live outside my home, <coughs> all right, and my heart bleeds every day. Mm -hmm. But considering that I have been privileged enough to live here, I look at the other side and I sympathize. I can afford that luxury. But somebody in my part of the world, I understand. Okay, can he afford? He cannot. And and particularly when you see. The continuation of the injustice. <coughs> when you much, see the, uh, again, again, to be honest with you, I want, I want to uh, save the other side from this bitterness, from this. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. So unless, unless you have the support, you under the, the, the international mm -hmm. community have paid both of us. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so I both, agree. Both of the, so I just. Both sides of the conflict. I understand your point. I just wanted to add something spiritually, okay. Uh, politically, we are struggling. I uh, totally agree with you. And so much injustice in this world. Every day we see in the news all the wars happening. Ba and that too, if the based on religion, firstly, we all are human beings. We've been taught the religion by our parents when we were born, right? And then we, for the whole life, we keep saying we belong to one religion or religion. But firstly, we were a human being, which we lost Absolutely. it, right? So, and we as it, any yeah. So now, regarding the spiritual journey, if you want to be, um, you know, growing as a spiritual person, you will see some trauma and injustice for sure. You will not understand the value of God. You will not understand the value of spirituality. You will not understand what is a real worth until unless you don't see suffering in your life. But anyway, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, I, I, yeah. So I think it's how you see the injustice, how you see suffering in your life. So if you see someone going, your loved ones dying in front of you, obviously it's the biggest suffering. But then you will realize this is the truth of life. We all have to go. Yes, this is yeah. the main reason I'm saying what, I'm say, what I have said is that the Universal Peace Foundation stand up for peace. Yep. And that's why I want to encourage them to open, to open this can of worms and really address it with honesty, yes. objectivity, sympathy for both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sympathy for both people. Without mm -hmm. fear. It's about time to say the truth. I agree. Mm -hmm. and, and, and acknowledge that unfortunately the Western world did not help us, neither help themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it's exactly what Biden has tried to give Israel the advice mm. that we have committed a lot of mistakes, you know, mm. uh, uh, when we invaded Iraq, when we have done so and so. But, but it's time to come clean yes. and within yes. ourselves, honest to say that we contributed. So how we are going to... No, that, that's and totally agree with you. We need someone, some organization to stand and they should have a power to do that. Like UN, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the UN itself is so unbiased, uh, not sorry, unbiased, is biased towards many countries. So this is going on and we are heading towards such a bad time, I think, every day, each and every day. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed.
Thank you. Thank you for your, your contributions, everybody. That's really excellent. Thank you. No, no, absolutely. It's such a raw nerve, I know. It's very, very understandable. Yeah. And I, I, I hope the things that I express don't come because we're trying to do a lot in a short time, come across rather superficial or glib. I don't mean that at all, you know. But I do think this kind of understanding which is coming, I touched on that about God as a God of heart or a God of suffering. This is part of the kind of, that this is coming now uh, to us, is part of the way of dealing with this, I believe. I think has some key to that because uh, if you say that really then there's, there's someone there who's suffering so acutely uh, as we suffer, then this is, you know, needs to awaken something in every person's heart, really, to avoid any more repetition of those things. So, hmm. so yes. Good. I was going to say, well, is there anybody who would like to give a song? Who would like to give a song? I don't want to be choosing somebody. For, for, uh, I had asked her to sing. Okay. 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 I, I, I was thinking it would be very nice to have a singer. So would you grace us with a with a song? Can I take? Is it? Where is that? Here. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Oh, no, it's okay. This microphone is fine. Yeah. If that's okay with you. Okay, singing in a micro in a uniform. Have you ever seen anyone singing in a uniform? Okay. Um, Margaret has been very kind, and UPF has been extremely great in my kind of life. Um, I'm not here to make a speech, but Margaret has been asking me and nudging me to say, you have to sing. So a song, it's, it's, it's kind of a prayer uh, which Sir Dr. Alama Iqbal uh, had written uh, in, in 1902, I think, something like that. But it relates to what we've been talking about. It relates to the God which lives in you. It relates to the God that we believe in. And it relates to who we are. It's about the me. It should not be a me. It should be us. So, uh, and I, when I say la ilaha illallah, that means like whatever it is, it is the supreme power. So if you, if you allow me to say if you, and you can possibly Google a translation, you can get the translation afterwards. Sanam kada hai jahan la 
ilaha illallah ilaha I love this verse when when it says that no matter whether it's, it's whatever weather it is it is about love and it is about laila haila ye nagma fasli gulo la raka nahi paaban ye nagma fasli gulo la raka nahi paaban bahar ho ke khiza bahar ho ke khiza la ilaha illallah la ilaha illallah she wanted me to sing a song which should be a jolly song so i don't know how to find a jolly song at this one thank you so much It's lovely. But she sang in a beautiful sari a few weeks ago. I went to to her uh, event. Sorry, it wasn't like something. I it was nice. It was very good. Very it's good. different when you are have done some practice with your music. No, but it came from your heart. So Absolutely. You it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Sab, you can come back. <laughs> <laughs> I have been with the BGC, so I know it has to be quick, right? Get, get on with it. She's not going to have to come back. Thank you. It's beautiful. That was the... Thank you very much. So, session three is bringing peace and reconciliation. Um, again, kind of looking... under the surface at some issues and historical processes rather than the kind of very necessary practical you know workings of how we might do that given the many intractable problems that we uh, face with in the world so uh, we've already identified kind of problems which are there in largely in the mind interesting to see that although at the formation of the united nations the um uh the kind of idea of any idea of spirituality was excluded right because of mainly the dominance of uh, uh soviet union and china um big communist nations then that was not possible but even you see in the preamble to the constitution for unesco the united nations educational scientific and cultural organization it says there since wars began in the minds of men it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed so in unificationism in these this uh, understanding we have a word that we call restoration restoration as you can uh, sense it means you know putting things right essentially and that may have equivalence in different relig- religious traditions but uh, this is the word which we use to uh, show and reveal certain principles which are there to uh, make this restoration possible so what is restoration well restoration is it's using really uh, the opportunity to put right past mistakes where a similar situation arises because it will do you know if there was some mistake in the past and it's unresolved then other other circumstances will arise where they can be looked at as opportunities to do things differently if you like uh so where you know in the past one was giving in to certain temptations if you give in to those same temptations it'll only continue a destructive pattern and we want to avoid that Uh, so it rev- is necessary to make a very conscious decision uh not to repeat those problems and when you follow your conscience rather than repeating tendencies that come from the fallen nature as we described it 
then we have this opportunity for restoration and you're breaking a certain cycle of abuse or wrongdoing and you're breaking that pattern of fallen history. As I said, those, those aspects of fallen nature are like tendencies. So it means it's very easy to slip into for people. It's like swimming downstream. But if you want to do things differently, you have to do the difficult thing, which is going upstream, right? You have to swim in the opposite direction. So it's very easy people get, get as we see, drawn into cycles of violence and uh, feel justified to do that. So how to break that is really key. And until restoration on a particular level is uh, accomplished and realized, you can be sure that the same problems will occur. That goes with the territory, really. So how do we change the nature of things? If Imagine you have a certain position or status. It could be your health, for example, very practically speaking, or it could be uh, maybe you have a good relationship with a friend and then you lie to that friend, then you've lost your kind of, something's gone from that relationship uh, when you are found out as having told a lie and something which upset the person. So uh, those are small examples, but you know, if we have a current reality which is from losing an original position or status, we have to make a journey back. So this is being restored. Our reality is being turned back into that originally, uh, original position uh, uh, or status or standing. And um, you know, for that, we have to pay some price, essentially. Uh, something has to be done. Something has to be offered, and it has to be uh, a conscious effort to restore what was lost. It needs to go in a kind of opposite uh, direction as well, a kind of reverse way to how it came about. And you're taking responsibility to correct any misconduct, even on your own part. And we have to recognize that, and often that's a tough thing in any um, kind of restoration situation is, is coming to realize what mistakes I made in the past and how I can overcome those. So um, obviously it's, it's clear if you're uh, unwell, if you've lost your good health, you need to diagnose the problem, you need to find a cure which is related to that problem but sending you in the opposite direction, right? Back to reclaim your lost health. In religion, it's very interesting to see that there's a, a common tradition uh, and it's spelt out more clearly in Father Moon's teaching because his mind was to analyze and to be able to discern certain principles at work. Because once you can do that, then you can utilize those principles uh, for yourself and for other situations. So. Uh, there are essentially two steps in this restoration process. One is reconciling with God and higher values. We saw how important those were in our original lecture. So this might be, uh, when we look at religion as a kind of means to an, uh, um, an end, to be a restorative vehicle, some people describe it as, you need to study scripture, to seek insights, to uh, engage in prayer and meditation with a lot of self-reflection is very helpful. So you're stimulating and awakening the conscience. It's being fed by good sources. And uh, it might involve some kind of confession or um, opening up to somebody that you can trust and in this process restoring a love relationship with your creator, with God. People have chosen different paths. Some choose a path of celibacy, going without any sexual relationships or marriage. Some choose kind of poverty and obedience, the three classic areas of a monk or nun's life. They are vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. But somewhere that also doesn't lead, and this relates to Costa's uh, point, really. It's, it's very helpful, even people making those sacrifices might be paying a price for other people. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it's not an end yet, because if everybody followed that path, uh, humanity would die out, we wouldn't multiply. So it's obviously not saying 
do this and don't do anything else, but just I feel I should make this kind of offering. I should make this um, kind of total devotion of my life to put things right in my life first. Um, so, you know, I can respect people who choose to do that and uh, have had wonderful conversations with monks and nuns who are some of the best people. If they did have children, they'd probably be some of the best children. This was my conclusion, right? Yeah. You know, it's ironic. And uh, Father Moon once said in he, he wanted, he never could realize in his lifetime, except for individuals, uh, he wanted to get all the monks together and bless them in marriage with all the nuns. <laughs> <laughs> but he meant that in such a loving way, right? Really, genuinely loving way. Recognizing the quality of, of those people, actually, who better, you know, to... Because tragically, no, no children come from their, you know, their offspring. So, anyway, um, this we often call the vertical relationship, um, restoring this vertical relationship, and that's quite commonly used in different fields of religion. Um, because you're centering on God's word or higher values, this idea of higher or above, even though physically it's not, right? It's still kind of uh, perceived that way. So self-reflection, awakening the conscience in this way. But that's not all. We also need to do horizontal restoration, and that's uh, uh, establishing a proper order in relationships with other people. So these two things are necessary and for progress, we need success in both of these areas to move closer to the goal of peace. So we need to restore the vertical relationship and improve and better the horizontal relationship. This set me thinking, I mean, uh, between the time when I last gave this lecture and now, I was thinking about this aspect of the golden rule. You've come across that, I'm sure, right? Many books refer to this and many traditions refer to this. And I thought, well, let's do one of those uh, interfaith searches on the golden rule. So here in, I don't think we've got any Zoroastrians with us, have we? Any Parsis? No? Uh, but in that literature, you'll see that nature only is good when it shall not do unto another whatever is not good for its own self. It's a version of the so-called golden rule. Here's one from Hinduism. This is the sum of duty. Do naught to others that which, if done to thee, would cause pain. Very similar, isn't it? Uh, here's from Confucianism. Never do unto others what you would not like them to do unto you. Put in the negative. Maybe that says something about its kind of rather humble approach, not wanting to dictate to anybody in that way, but just naturally find, find a path. Uh, in Christianity, you have in a positive, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So two, two ways round. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, there are more. This is from Buddhism. Hurt not others with that which pains yourself. And in Islam, we have no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brothers what he desires for himself. Uh, and the Baha'i religion, a very beautiful uh, source. Blessed is he who prefers his brother before himself. That kind of idea. One more. Space for one more there. Let's try Judaism. What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. Right? This was Rabbi Hillel in the first century. So, yes, Jews so concerned with laws, 630-odd laws in the Old Testament and books of commentary explaining those laws and putting them into context and examples and etc. But in the end, he said, this is it. Just all the rest is commentary. What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? So a fruitful search uh, from my point of view. Um, when you look at Jesus' central teaching which has Jewish origins, it's along this line. Sorry, this is just because of overheating of the, of the light. Don't worry, it's uh, uh, just getting too hot. 
must be something I said. I don't know. <clears throat> he was asked, he was put on the spot by the keepers of the law, the Pharisees, to uh, uh, say what was the greatest law in the whole Torah, the books that we call the Old Testament in the Christian tradition. The, you know, uh, so 630 odd laws. But um, so they felt, oh, we've got you now, because how can you pick out one, right? Um, but he had no difficulty. He obviously knew this inside out. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, or all your strength, is sometimes translated. Um, so these are words not new to Jesus himself. He's quoting the scripture of his day, right? The Torah, the Deuteronomy. Um, which itself is interesting because he's doing what he was asked to do. What's the greatest law? It's words that are spoken almost every day in the Jewish community or Jewish household. Uh, the, but then he wasn't satisfied with that. He said, you know, okay, you ask for one, but you're going to get two. Yeah? So the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. And again, words not new to him. He was delving back into Leviticus, book of laws, so many uh, details there about washing and cleaning and all kinds of things and cooking. Um, and it's a little harder to find this. You have to search a bit, but there it is. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he was putting these two together. And what are those two aspects? The first is the vertical aspect, right? And the second is, you know, with your neighbor. It's, and you'll find that in other traditions. Like I say, the wording is, is more modern way is to, to isolate it as principles and bullet points and this kind of thing, right? Uh, but that's almost like a teaching method. But you'll find it in I Islam as well. Here's, I love this uh, quotation from uh, the uh, second uh, surah there. And be steadfast in prayer, which is your first vertical aspect, and regular in charity, which is the, you know, or horizontal. And whatever good you send forth for your souls before you, you shall find it with Allah. So, you know, it's just doing good yourself. You know, any reward will come. You don't have to worry about that, right? Someone knows what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? So be steadfast in prayer and regular in mm -hmm. charity. So uh, that confirms this, this kind of idea is necessary, and it's spelt out in this way because both of these aspects are essential for restoration and for peacemaking efforts. Now, if I can be allowed to go back to that biblical story, because Father Moon uh, drew so much out of this with his own kind of revelation and uh, reason, um, I'm taking that liberty. But uh, if we go back to that Adam and Eve story, it's like a parent's problem, or problem in the parent's generation, you can say. We've identified here uh, the view that it's illicit love or it's inherited fallen nature through that, which gets passed on. After all, this is sometimes referred to as original sin. So what can be passed on through the generations? Well, the kind of wrong practice or immature practice of love can be passed on and uh, a fallen nature can be passed on because it's also partly learnt and in inherited that way, but it's also kind of in the blood. Uh, this is the way we do things. This is the way we react. This is uh, our first instinct. So uh, this parent's problem gets visited in the biblical story on the next generation, interestingly, and that's where we have two sons, Cain the elder one and Abel the younger one, um, and it ends up with Cain uh, murdering his brother Abel. So in this first family, there's already the first murder in the second generation. It's a very tragic circumstance there. So with a myth or story or actuality or whatever, you know, however we interpret that, there are very interesting lessons that uh, Father Moon derives from this. And I want to spend a little time just to to uh, elucidate that, if that's okay, then in the story, which forms a kind of archetype for conflict or what we see in conflict, I mean, that's, this is the beginning. You know, all war is, is brother against brother, essentially, and it's mostly men, right? So it's brother against brother. Um, 
we see that in this, the way it's put in this story is that these two sons, Cain and Abel, are asked to make an offering to God, and they both do that. But Abel, the younger son's offering, is accepted, but Cain's offering is not accepted. So he's put in a position to deal with a lot of jealousy, resentment, things which were there uh, on the part of the archangel in the story of uh, Adam and Eve. So he's, certain things are resurfacing in this next generation, including the feelings and the kind of position uh, for this uh, uh, elder son, Cain. But if we look at this, and um, I've always thought this is, uh, uh, from my point of view, it's an amazing bit of psychology here. This is God speaking to Cain, giving a little, uh, I don't say warning, it's kind of, fatherly advice really says there if you do what is right will you not be accepted wow right in other words I want you to be accepted I want you to do what's right but you have to do what's right in life right uh, but if you do not do what is right sin is crouching at your door it's like ready to spring it's looking for an opportunity to get you its desire is for you but you must master it. In other words, you must say, okay, I have these feelings, but I'm going to get the better of those feelings. I'm not going to give in to those feelings. I'm going to say it stops here. And in my parents' generation, maybe these things came up and it destroyed that uh, you know, generation of the family and set us off on a bad foot. But I'm going to do things differently. This is restoration. Yeah. If he could think that way, this is restoration. So it's interesting that it... More than just telling a story, it sheds light on these kind of inner workings. In, in a short space of time, it's very profound, actually. So if we take the kind of history from then on, and even somewhere, this is the process that's going on where there is conflict. It's actually a means, a desperate last attempt means to divide good from evil. Know, where there's a kind of mixture going on, sometimes on both sides, right? But it has to be kind of clarified. So uh, we'll see this process, and it's there in religious traditions, particularly in kind of offerings. We look down on that, and people dismiss um, uh, biblical tradition because, oh, you, you, you see people in the early books there making offerings of animals, you know, how terrible, right? Well, we don't do that today. But it had a meaning, it had a purpose, actually. And it was related to this, symbolically, it was the person making this division in themselves uh, where they had committed some mistake and they want to separate out the good and offer that up and have the evil kind of drained of evil blood and, and come underneath the good side, as it were. So this is what's going on in that uh, kind of situation, but it needs to go on as history progresses, less in terms of an external object, but more in my own heart. You know, my heart has to go through this division process. Uh, so where you have a, a mixture of evil and good, which is our, like our first ancestors after the fall, where you have this, uh, these two minds in one person, uh, God can't deal with that, and actually it's a hindrance to your progress. So they need to be separated out. That means into relative good or relative evil. And this was done, interestingly, by following this story in the next generation. So Cain is in the position of being relatively evil and Abel in the position of being relatively good. They both had fallen nature, right? But Abel is recognized for his righteousness and his offering when he makes it is acceptable to God. So it's in a way saying that there's enough good there that, that his, his heart can be accepted. But Cain, no. It's like, go back and try again, or think, think again, or maybe do it differently, or maybe you're not sincere, or you're not really serious, or maybe you've had a, a good few run-ins with your brother already, right? And perhaps you need to sort that out first, right, before you think of doing this. So in this process, this separation process, relative good needs to be lifted up. Biblical language is using words like exalted or lifted up. It has to be kind of you know, recognized and encouraged. 
Uh, but the evil side is not to be done away with or cast out or you know, destroyed. No, rather it has to come underneath the good side so that the relative evil side must um, come through the good side back to that purpose of goodness and be united. So they can be united centering on that purpose of goodness and make a good foundation like we had before. Are you with me? Yeah. See how it ties in? So what was happening between these brothers? Well, we can say, in light of what we talked about just a few minutes ago, uh, then we see that uh, uh, Abel is the one to be proven faithful and righteousness. So he gets that kind of approval. Uh, this is making that vertical foundation that we talked about, right? This is that first aspect. Then Cain has to conquer the fallen nature in himself. You must master it. These feelings of anger, jealousy, resentment, whatever, you have to get the better of those because they're in you. And if you get the better of those, they'll be like out of your family for the rest of time. That's the, that's the kind of implication. So it, it's like the American business uh, phrase, you know, people have on their desk. The buck stops here, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> this is a little bit, you know, what's going on in biblical terms, right? It's the opportunity to say that, you know, the buck stops here. Or, you know, if I, as tragically happens, Cain gives in to those feelings, you know, it just multiplies the problem. So this is the beginning of this kind of conflict situation. So Cain is there to make the horizontal foundation through humbling himself and coming through his brother. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's think what should have happened. Uh, Abel, being humble, is accepted by God. His offering is accepted. Uh, but he should forgive and he should be very tolerant in the face even of maybe some harsh words or some bad language from his brother. You know, he shouldn't be too bothered by that. He should think, well, hey, you know, I see he's upset, but let's try and help him. And he should serve his brother so that he can melt that resentment. Even though it's a hard job for a younger brother to do for an elder brother, it's necessary. So if he has that perspective and has made that vertical foundation, he should have enough heart to do that, right? Uh, Cain um, then has to overcome his resentment and his feelings of being rejected, which you could say is justifiable resentment. He's put in a position to feel those things, and you know, until he makes changes in himself, he's going to be stuck with that. But he needs to recognize his brother's value. That means maybe going to his younger brother and saying, could you tell me why yours was accepted and mine wasn't? Is there something I've missed out on, or I don't know, or should be doing differently? It takes some humility, doesn't it, right? But that would be the key to his you know, solving this problem, actually. And his brother should respond willingly and happily and, and helping. Hey, come, I'll show you, or let's do it together, or, you know, um, something like that. So he should rejoice in his brother's success. It's something that often with fallen nature we don't do. We're happy when uh, a person we perceive as an, uh, a rival or an enemy has a downfall, but we want, you know, we should be encouraging people when they do well, right? And Cain should move on from hatred and be ready to reconcile. So as the story unfolds, we get this archetype of conflict. Cain was consumed with resentment over this perceived injustice. It was very much from his perspective, right? That's why I say perceived. He didn't love his brother from God's standpoint. He didn't you know, think, how much do you love my brother, or what is it about his offering that you love? And he's unable to control his anger, so he ends up murdering his brother, which is horrific, right? Horrific. And Abel uh, is loved by God, but he can't win his brother's heart, right? And take away his resentment, and he needs to find a way to do that. Uh, he had God's blessing but maybe he wouldn't really share it or help his brother. This is where we start to see uh, faults which lie often on the side even of religious people. They tend to be a little bit self-righteous, right? And think, you know, God is with us, or I'm, you know, in a special relationship with God, therefore, you know, you see how it develops. It should learn the lessons even from things this far back. 
It's interesting then that in the uh, book of Matthew, we have Jesus telling a little story or giving some advice, really. It's more than a story. It's advice to people. He says, and don't you think this might relate to that Cain Abel story? If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Very profound, very beautiful advice. Uh, Even it's like your brother has something against you. Maybe you don't feel it's your fault, right? The way that the language is put, right? So maybe you don't, and it's easy to feel, well, I'm, I'm okay, I'm justified. But it's like, yeah, he has something against me. Let me go and sort that out first, and then uh, I'll make my offering. It'll be more meaningful if you were to do that. Now, I'm going to skip a lot, but Father Moon brought out a very interesting parallel, an opportunity for restoration, and showed how, in the biblical sources at least, these, these opportunities are there recorded, and we see them sometimes taken advantage of, and sometimes the mistakes are repeated. And it's all there. It's like you know, good things and bad things. That's why it's such a precious uh, source. So there's a later story with a similar struggle. And this is, involves twins, Jacob and Esau. Jacob buys a birthright from his brother. Uh, because you know he's the younger of the twins and Esau is the elder. But his mother has advised him and she got this feeling when they were both in her womb that the elder should serve the younger and that a, you know, great nations would come from both of them, actually. Yeah. But somewhere that younger should be the center of the family against the kind of normal practice, right? So this is actually resolving a situation which started between... Uh, Adam and, in this case, Archangel Lucifer, but also uh, Cain and Abel. It's restoring that situation. So um, Jacob gets a blessing from his blind father Isaac with a little bit of you know, trickery from his mother's help, not his own doing. Uh, his brother, when he finds out he hasn't got the blessing promised to him, is very angry and wants to kill his brother. But he does have a sense of decency, he says, I will kill you when my father has passed away. I will wait until then. <laughs> so uh, Jacob has to escape from the wrath of his brother. It means go away from the family, which is not a good solution. He goes to his mother's brother in Haran and stays there 21 years. He builds his family and his wealth. He's mistreated by his uncle Laban, and he's cheated 10 times, but probably... He learns through that, this was Father Moon's insight, he learned from that the feelings that his brother had, you know, and therefore he knew what it was. He dealt with them, and this was his strength, but then, you know, he was ready to go and return to his brother and make peace with his brother. He struggles all night in what's described as a fight with an angel, and he goes towards his brother And when he sees his brother coming, and he's heard that he's coming out to meet him with 400 armed warriors, so he's still angry, uh, but nevertheless he sends gifts ahead of him, livestock, servants, children, sends them all. And as he sees, sets eyes on his brother, he bows down seven times, which is like really saying, you are my respected elder brother, and I want to return everything that maybe is rightfully yours, I give it to you. So it's a very beautiful story that, you know, it responds to some reading, I would think. And, but this is an opportunity for restoration, which Jacob works for and seizes. In a way, he does most of the work, right? And has to suffer away from his family and all these kind of resentments from his brother. But his heart is to reunite Uh, for the sake of the family and for the sake of the future. And he manages to do that, but he's fulfilling that first kind of vertical aspect of restoring that relationship with God, or foundation of faith, we call it. And then his brother is the one who overcomes that fallen nature because he embraces his brother. He lets go of all that resentment. It just disappears. It's interesting how quickly it can disappear, actually. 
This is something we must remember and take heart from. Because sometimes, uh, you know, people can be thinking this problem will never go away. It was like that with the Berlin Wall, right? We thought it would never go away. But, you know, it just kind of pff, collapsed because many spiritual conditions were being made behind the scene, I tell you, right? I know of some of them, but I'm sure many more were being done. Uh, so both Cain and Abel face the same, Cain and Esau, so these two stories, both face the same test. Do you follow me? Cain decides to kill his brother. It's always the murderer's way out, right? It's like, if I get rid of the other person, everything will be all right. But of course, that's never the case. It just multiplies the problem. But Esau, in this instant, comes to love his brother from God's standpoint, which is reversing that first aspect of fallen nature. He restores to him a true elder brother position, which is that second aspect, reversed. He no longer seeks to dominate righteous, unrighteously his brother. He puts all those thoughts aside. They just disappear. And he's in a position to multiply goodness, which in this case is peace and harmony in the family, right? And, um, you know, they end up in a kind of love war. They're saying, oh, no, you have these things. No, you have these things. I've got enough. You have them, you know. is this kind of uh, uh, battle going on. So why I've spent a little time going into this, and I hope that's uh, okay, <clears throat> is uh, this becomes, in Father Moon's approach, uh, for various serious things, even world-level problems, a kind of paradigm. And he re refers to it many times in speeches. So way beyond its original story and that context, it became a cain able paradigm. So, and this is... To me, it's, it's rather interesting. It starts out with this conflict where Cain kills Abel. Uh, then, in generations later, there's a family which has twins, and the elder doesn't kill the younger, but they unite together. So that's resolving this or restoring this on a family level. Are you with me? It's some major breakthrough in terms of restoration. But we see a line that continues on. Uh, we call this kind of Abel-type view of life and a Cain-type view of life. Two ways of looking at the world. One is more uh, faith-affirming and uh, faith-based. One is more practical and concerned about injustices and this kind of thing. So we see uh, a line through Abel and a line through Cain. This emerges into a kind of Cain-Abel context at the time of the birth of Jesus. This is 2,000 years ago, right? And at that time, there's little Israel that's prepared itself to receive uh, a Messiah figure, uh, not recognizing that that person is Jesus uh, <clears throat> and still waiting for that person. But surrounding it is the big empire of Rome, which has a lot of kind of Cain-type qualities. It's very quick to violence, right? And lots of its traditions are violent traditions. <clears throat> it's a slave culture. But uh, Israel, on the other hand, is much more pious, much more God-affirming in, in a true sense, uh, if you compare the religions of Israel and the religions of Rome. So one is developing and expanding the kind of Cain-type view of life, and the other is expanding the Abel-type view of life. Are you with me, or have I lost everybody? It's okay? <laughs> so this is now happening on a national level. Huh? Uh, Father Moon's interesting insight, you know, because of, especially because of his Christian background, is very interesting uh, and challenging. Um, he said, really, at this stage, uh, Israel should have accepted Jesus. If they had accepted Jesus in the role of the expected Messiah, the one they were waiting for, he could have lived a long life, could have taught many important things. They would all have been written down, which they never were in his lifetime. Uh, and the, the nation would unite around him, and from there people would go to other parts of the Roman Empire and make connections with, with people. And a lot of interesting spiritual developments which were taking place at that time. It's like the world was getting ready for some big transition 2,000 years ago. 
So we see that this kind of coalesces at the time of Jesus into the traditions of Hellenism, coming out of Greece and Rome, and Hebraism, coming out of the Hebrews. And uh, so scholars will talk about these traditions, Hellenism and Hebraism. And as I said, you know, the hope was there for Jesus to be accepted. You know, a uh, certain Christian view, almost like a standard view, is that uh, Jesus came in order to die. Have you heard that? For our sins. Fa Father Moon doesn't deny the efficacy of that, but saying, actually, first of all, Jesus should be received, right? So uh, all Christian theology is a little bit like um, it's uh, theology looking back, right? It happened that way, therefore it must have been, maybe it was meant to happen that way. But life isn't usually like that from my experience, you know. Uh, so if we start, allow ourselves to think differently, a lot of things start to happen, including age-old barriers between Judaism and Christianity start to break down, and Christianity and Islam, which came later, start to break down because of this changed viewpoint. And historically, for me, it makes a lot of sense. That means if Jesus had had good support primarily from John the Baptist, another key figure, which he didn't have, and his family, which he didn't have, interestingly, and that's recorded in the New Testament. Uh, if he had that support, then it could have gone to reach the uh, leadership of Israel, the religious leaders of the time, they would have supported. And then it would have gone out to Rome, and from Rome it would have gone out even to other cultures in the time. Well, uh, this is a huge kind of bombshell of a speculation, and I don't normally talk about it, but I felt I have to mention it today, right? Um, this would reach the world. This is world restoration, possible even 2,000 years ago. Why? And this is in the core text of Father Moon's uh, teaching, which is interesting, is what God was doing, he says, uh, around the world in other parts and other cultures. In the period 400 to 600 years before Jesus was born, you have Confucius in China, you have Lao Tzu also with uh, Taoism, you have Buddha in southern India, you have Zoroaster in Persia, you have uh, transformation in Indian culture through the Upanishads, you have uh, uh, some kind of uh, a reformation movement going on in Judaism to bring it back to its roots through Malachi, 400 years before Jesus. You have Socrates in Greece that Father Moon always thought of as a great religious leader, not normally thought of that way, but for his qualities and for his contribution to civilization, you know, is really up there as a thinker and a person who was, as you know, willing to sacrifice his life on trumped up charges of leading young people astray, right? So these, these figures were all alive, active, making their own foundation in different cultures, different languages, unconnected from each other, right? But that's all happening. It's like the world is getting ready. And the thing that is common is, it, well, it's brought out by one academic, a British ac academic, Karen Armstrong, very wonderful writer. She said, as far as these sages, and that's referring to those leaders of religion at that time, as far as these sages were concerned, respect for the sacred rights of all human beings was religion. That was their religion. If people behaved with kindness and generosity to their fellows, they could save the world. Wow. And then she goes on to say, bringing it forward to today, we need to rediscover this ethos. We must learn to live and behave as though people in countries remote from our own are as important as ourselves. Wow. Great, a great thinker, a great soul. She has spent a certain time in different religious traditions herself, immersing herself in you know, Islam, in Buddhism, in, in Hinduism, in these, these world religions. Very amazing person. But interestingly, you know, uh, this is not the first person to notice the, this was a time of great transformation. She calls her book The Great Transformation, referring to this uh, Karl Jaspers, uh, a German historian called the uh, Axial Period. So uh, 
what Father Moon is saying here is there was an opportunity 2,000 years ago that wasn't realized. And that's why we've had a prolongation of trouble and suffering and difficulties and wars and conflicts over the last 2,000 years, right? Christianity talks about bringing in God's kingdom, but have you seen it in this world? No, we're still stuck. And interestingly, those traditions are largely, they continue, rather than coming together uh, at that time, those traditions have continued on separately over this last 2,000 years. So they're separate. That's one reason why you know, inter-religious work is so important and why UPF is doing that. Because in this, we're coming to another opportunity, right? to bring all these things together, and that will happen, I tell you, it will happen. This is the work, you know, in Christianity they call it like a second coming or this kind of idea, but uh, different people have different expectations. It's all about the same kind of transformation which is going to happen. So here we have the fruit of Cain-type thinking, and here is the kind of fruit of Abel-type thinking. So that is why almost any uh, situation that you meet today seems to have two opposing camps. Have you noticed that? It's a bit strange, isn't it, right? Even our parliament is designed that way. It's two, two, two sets of you know, opposing seats, right? Because any issue wants to be debated. Uh, some are for and some are against, right? So it's different views of life, actually. It's one tends to be more cane like more materialistic, more prone to violence. One tends to be more faith-affirming, but not always, uh, and uh, tends to put value on the individual in a little uh, stronger way. So you get these kind of, why I said it was a, a paradigm or typology in Father Moon's teaching. It's like, yes, well, there was Cain and Abel, and we said they need to, you know, Cain needs to come through his brother to, to be united and centered on a common purpose and a good purpose. But in a way, this is our legacy. This is us with fallen nature. Our body and mind, it's like body is Cain and mind is Abel, right? And they're fighting with each other, right? So what is the body has to come under the mind. And you know, sometimes uh, religion has been described as the, the way to have the body obey the mind. You know? And some are very good at that, right? Some are very good at... Um, getting to the roots of the mind problem. Buddhism is particularly good on that because you know it's worth exploring for that benefit alone. And I don't think it excludes your other beliefs at all. Right? It's just very interesting how it's centered on that. And certain traditions, so obviously not just believing certain things. No, that's, no, that's in a way neither here nor there. What is important is you know, disciplining the, the, the body and having it come under the mind and elevating the mind. It's going through the same process. So we need to you know, study more and pray more and have the body. This is why religions all, almost all, will do things like prayer and fasting. Fasting is denying the body. And people find when they go through a period of fasting, the mind becomes clearer. And they have more strength and more will to do what they want to do. Or they see a solution which they didn't see before to some problem. So it's a way of, you know, using, using this uh, principle. So any devotee needs to find any guru, I just use these terms, right, uh, for their kind of way to a, a more elevated future, truth-filled and love-filled future, right? So this is why religions tend to have one person at the center, be it prophet or... Uh, guru or you know Messiah or somebody is there, right? Tends to be a man. In uh, unificationism, we say it needs to be a couple. Interestingly, but that fits in with the whole blessing uh, theology, which I mentioned. Uh, then you can say, well, communism in the you know to still use these terms, especially in the 20th century, is is the fruit of that Cain type view of life. And democracy is the fruit of the able type view of life, which is why when democracy is tied into its kind of especially Christian roots in Europe, it's good. But if it abandons those, it's as open to self-centered abuse and exploitation and greed as anything else, right? So uh, communism, in a way, the best of that needs to come through the best of democracy 
to make a, a kind of unified new tradition. Any issue has some Cain type view, any issue has some Abel type view. You know, as a RE teacher at school, I know I had to <laughs> present this to teenagers like abortion or uh, euthanasia, all these kind of things, right? Ethical conundrums, right? Mm -hmm. But you'll see these two sides to everything. One is more Cain type. That doesn't mean evil and good. Don't shorthand me on this one. It's not one side is evil, one side is good. No, both are mixtures of good and evil, but somewhere one is in this more Cain type tradition and needs to let go of certain things. And Abel also has responsibilities. Wow, how are we doing? Everybody all right? Let me jump just to think about, because um, I, I mentioned this idea of something, someone coming or some kind of, it's interesting that most religious traditions have the idea of return of their founder or of a Imbam Mahdi or of a true man coming in Confucianism, of a Saushiant in Zoroastrianism. You know, they have this idea that in everything is kind of going to come to a good conclusion when someone returns. This is Buddhism. I thought it was fairly neutral to choose, right? But I like this. I like the way it's worded. This is the Sutra of the Great Accomplishment of the Maitreya Buddha. It's like a, a second coming of Buddha. Listen attentively with one heart. A man whose spirit shines brightly. A man whose mind is completely unified. Hmm. A man whose virtue excels everyone. Such a man will truly appear in this world. When he preaches precious laws, all the people will totally be satisfied as if the thirsty drink sweet drops of rain from heaven and each and every one will attain the path of liberation from struggles. How do you like that? Isn't it amazing? Right, so... Uh, there was a way to... Jump. I'm going to, you have to excuse me, I'm going to list, miss out certain slides, but just for a uh, cause of time, you know. Um, even so, as we're well aware, there are remaining conflicts coming. And when we majorly or externally solve the problem of the Cain Abel division of communism and democracy, uh, still there are surfacing problems around the world involving races or nationalities or religions. and. We're living through this time at the moment. And um, the only, the only positive take, I suppose, is that I think things can be solved quicker than they could in the past, you know, when these things arise. So let's end today with some, from my part, uh, we still have a, a talk from Mrs., Mr. Robin Marsh, but um, with some hope-giving quotations. How would you like that? This is uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He said, we must discover the power of love, the power, the redemptive power of love. That's interesting, it's kind of putting things right, this kind of power. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. We will be able to make men better. Love is the only way. He also said here, we never get rid of an enemy by meeting hate with hate. We get rid of an enemy by getting rid of enmity. Wow. And it wouldn't be right uh, to conclude without uh, words from a uh, founder of UPF. And he said this, I am teaching you to love those who hate you. If you love them, sooner or later they will come to like you. If you return good three times for every time someone does you wrong, Eventually, that person will bow his head. Mm -hmm. Try it yourself and see if I'm not, if I'm right or not. Everyone has a conscience. Amen. Leave you with that thought. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you and uh, appreciate it so much. Well, can I just say something? You may indeed, yeah. Margaret. Yeah, you need a microphone? Not that your voice lacks power. Hello. But there we go. For the uh, view, viewers on Zoom. Uh, 
just when you were talking about, you know, restoration, I thought about uh, an incident happened, and I, a friend of mine, not so much friend, friend, uh, somebody I know, said that, you know why I, why I like being, why I like being uh, Catholic? When I do something wrong, I'll go, and he will say to you, give three Hail Marys. And I said, what does that mean? And he says, you say Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. I said, what does that do? It, it, uh, it c completely wipes your, your uh, you know, whatever, sin. And I said, no, darling, no. I, I was very <laughs> enthusiastic then, many years ago, with our principles. And I said, you know, to make something right, you go to the person that you did wrong, and you say to that person, I am, you know, it's, it, I am getting the courage to come and tell you that I did something wrong. Please forgive me. And for, for that forgiveness, you have to work. You know, like prayers or whatever it is, you know. And that guy, if that person accepts it, then you have started restorative, uh, you know, thing. Not even completed it. You know, and he was surprised. He said, what are you talking about? The, the man was saying, no, I, I, why, why do that when I can do <laughs> the three Hail Marys? And I said, because that doesn't work. You could always have to come back. Always have to come back. You make the mistake always, you know, if you've not gone to the, to the heart of it. That's just to help, you know, to understand the situation. Uh, uh, Mr. What shall we do now, Mr. Uh, Robin? Um, Mr. Robin. Do you want tea and coffee? I, I, have, I have very many people who have backache, like me. <laughs> and he, she's got to go to another event. She had the tea. She, can, you give, can we give the ambassadors for peace first? Okay, stick to the program, then you start. Yeah, try. Okay. Anybody who wants to have tea and coffee outside, you could go and get it. Do not spill it on the carpet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You don't have to go downstairs. It's right here. Yeah. And I can, I can prepare for you as well. And come back very quickly, because Robin, Robin is going to talk. He, 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 will talk, he will talk very shorter, much shorter. Robin. Yeah, I know. <laughs> just as long as I can get. Yeah.